Testing one, two. Hello, how is it going, everybody? Today we're jumping into Ezekiel chapter 9. Text is up on screen already. Let me check to make sure we're not lagging. Guess what we are. So let me fix that real quick. Okay, that should fix it. Let's see, let's see. Today's reading is gonna be is gonna be real interesting. Yep, that fixed it. Okay, so we're gonna jump into chapter nine. And I I skimmed a little bit, so I know this is good. Today this is gonna be interesting. So we'll jump into nine right now. The wicked are slain. We're continuing off of uh what we were talking about yesterday, remember we were discussing the abominations in the temple. We're sort of going over the judgment, but we're getting it from a different perspective. We're getting it from Ezekiel's perspective, and God has been revealing things because Ezekiel is prophesying to the people in Babylon. So, different perspective. Um, and Ezekiel has been getting visions from God, so direct visions from God, and he is detailing them completely. So that's the another aspect that we're getting very different from both Jeremiah and Isaiah. So let's jump into this. The wicked are slain. Ezekiel chapter 9. Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice. Let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly, Six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. So, who are these people? Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near. Are we talking about the Babylonians when they had charge over the city? Or are we talking about, like, who are we talking about? Let me see if the Bible's got anything to say. He is the God of Israel, who has been speaking since Ezekiel saw the glory of God. Those who have charge over, this is the sense given to a Hebrew word that is frequently used of a vengeful visitation. Okay, a vengeful visitation. Why would the people who are already living in the city be visiting the city? I can understand why they would want, why it would be a vengeful visitation, because their city was just taken over. But the only visitors were the Babylons. I'm I'm probably misunderstanding completely. So let me look it up. Ezekiel nine commentary. Let those who have charge over the city draw near. In his vision of Jerusalem and the corruptions of the, at the temple, Ezekiel heard God speaking with a loud voice, calling forward six men who, in some sense, had charge over the city. Right, because last we were reading was the abominations in the temple. So this is most likely before the judgment. Those who had charge over the city, so which means they were not the Babylonians, these were people of Jerusalem. Those who had charge over the city were those whom God set to watch over the welfare of the city. They were not earthly agents, but heavenly. Angels are frequently called men because of their outward appearance. What? So these aren't people who ruled over Jerusalem. These were angels, like guardian angels of Jerusalem. Even though they called them men, we're referring to angels because they looked like men. Wow, how do we know that to be the case? That does not make sense to me. What do you guys think? Let me know. Um, that is odd. Let's see the actual text again. Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near, even each 
with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men, that commentary is saying it's not talking about men, it's talking about angels. And just because angels look like men, sometimes they're referred to as men. That feels like a reach. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces the north, each with his battle axe in hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. Okay, so what is an inkhorn? I'm guessing it's a horn that contains ink that they used to dip a pen in. That's what I'm assuming. An ink horn. A small container made of horn or similar material formerly used to hold ink. Boom, I nailed it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so if these are angels, the one clothed in linen, I'm assuming that would be Jesus. But if they're not angels, for number one, why would we refer to men? We got an explanation in the, that article, I mean in that commentary, saying that it's because they looked like men, but I feel like that's not enough. You know? Let me look up another commentary. Ezekiel 9 commentary. <whistles> Bible Hub. Them that have charge over the city, not earthly officers. Okay, so they're talking about angels too here. But those to whom God had especially entrusted the execution of his will concerning Jerusalem. They have charge over the city, either the oversights or the visitations of the city. The latter is most natural visitations being said for those who visit. Ah. Visitation. So... That would lend itself to the idea that they were angels because they were visiting. The latter is most natural. Visitations being said of those who visit. That is the executioners. The verb may be rendered uh, as bring near or draw near. The executioners are at hand. Is less suitable to the loud cry and, immediate, and the immediate appearance of the seven men seems, to response to, seems in response to the summons. The persons addressed are called men, but they are clearly thought of as like superhuman, like angels who came to Sodom, like the angels with the sword drawn. Hmm. Clearly thought of as super, like a superhuman? Why, why clearly? Well, maybe we should keep reading and we'll find out. Six men in the vision, they appeared as men appeared as men yeah so look angels who had charge over the, ex the executing god executing god's judgment upon the city ah so so similar to sodom and gomorrah well let's see let's maybe we'll get some context if we keep going and had a writer's inkhorn at his side they went in and stood beside the bronze altar now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man. So now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. The cherub is a singular of the cherubim, right? So, And we, we looked at what the cherubim looked like in an earlier reading. Right? They look kind of like the living creatures that we saw. Where was that? Hmm. 
now the glory of the Lord, now the glory of God of Israel, had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. Let me see what my Bible's got to say. Like, where where was this cherub? Are we continuing off from what we were talking about earlier with the living creatures? Um, three. I mean, nine, three. Let's see. It is not clear. It is not clear whether the term cherub here indicates the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place or the cherubim of the throne with the wheels. And okay, that's what we're, we're going to get to, I guess. Either way, this picture, this picture is the departure of God's glory from the temple, then from Israel and then from Judah as seen in chapters 9 to 11. Since we're talking about the temple, I did think about that, right? If it was talking about, but were they, was that cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant? I spelled that wrong, didn't I? Ark of the Covenant, right? Every depiction I've seen, we looked at the, Where is Ark? We don't need to know where it is, but let me type in cherubim. Oh my gosh. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are face to fa are to face each other looking forward. Right? This is describing the cherubim on the mercy seat, on the Ark of the Covenant. Two cherubim. So why are, stretch out their wings, cover the mercy seat. Why, okay, we already got the description Maybe, maybe maybe the living creatures and the cherubim are different because when we talked about the living creatures, um, they had four wings and they had the four faces. But all the depictions of... When we type in cherubim, that's what comes up. But the Ark of the Covenant is not, never depicted having <clears throat> anything like the living creatures on it, right? Two wings. Two wings, two wings. No four faces. You know what I mean? So, like when we type in cherubim, stuff like this comes up. That doesn't look like what's on the Ark of the Covenant, you know? And that's a seraph. But seraphims have six wings, I believe. Cherubims have four wings. But what about the different multiple diff multiple faces? And then also, we talked about the living creatures before. I don't know if that differentiates between living creatures and the cherubim, so we'll see. Oh. And he called to the man clothed with linen, who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry. That'll be crazy if this is... The same is if this is one of the angels that uh, went down to Sodom and Gomorrah. Over all the abominations that are done within it. To the others, he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill. Do not let. Go through the midst of the city, through the go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. So there was, yesterday we talked about that. People were crying over the abominations because um, what was it? They were being destroyed? No. What was it? People. There were women who were crying over these abominations because Like they were crying over, I forgot the reason why, 
we talked about it yesterday. But they were crying over them. So that means they held, they, they still believed in him. And they cared for him. They were crying over him. So God is saying, put a mark on these people's foreheads. And that immediately made me think of like, okay, so you're marking them so you know, like, okay, these are the guys we're going to destroy. And that made, that made me think about the the mark of the beast. Is that what the mark of the beast is intended for? To like, to differentiate between the ones that are sh that are to be saved and the ones that are to be destroyed? Kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women. That's crazy. Do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. Okay, whoa. Go after him and kill everybody. But don't come near the ones that you marked. And put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. So maybe the mark here, by saying sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it, these people who are sighing and crying view these things as abominations, view praying to idol and pagan practices within the temple as abominations, and they're crying over the fact that it's taking place. So God is marking them, saying, hey, don't kill these people. Maybe that's what it means. So I got it. I got it backwards. One on whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders, who were before the temple. Then he said to them, "Defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out." And they went out and killed in the city. God is saying to defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Just let the bodies lay around there. Defile the place. Why? Because it is just a structure. It is just a building. It doesn't matter, really. It ma what matters is your relationship to God. The Ark of the Covenant is just an object. You know? I remember the children of Israel thought, hey, let's take the Ark of the Covenant out into battle and God will be with us. No, God's everywhere. You don't need to bring the Ark of the Covenant like you're some pagan nation carrying their idol with them into battle. It's just wood and gold. So God is here proving the point that the temple is just a structure. You don't need any holy place for me. You don't even have a relationship with me. You don't love me. You don't care about me. Why does, why, why? Well, who cares about the temple, honestly? And, I mean, they already defiled the temple, so it's already, it's already been defiled anyways. And killed in the city. So it was that while they were killing them, I was left alone. So, I get what they're saying with the whole superhuman thing, right? Most likely, they were not men. They were um, some sort of angelic being. You had, how many, six, seven guys destroying the entire city? <laughs> yeah. And I fell on my face and cried out and said, Oh, Lord God. Will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in pouring yep. out your fury on Jerusalem? He will. The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and the land is full of bloodshed, and the city full of perversity. For they say, the Lord has forsaken the land, and the Lord does not see. And as for me also... That must have annoyed God so much. The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and the land is full of bloodshed and the city full of perversity. For they say, the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see. The Lord has been seeing this whole while, has sent multiple prophets to you, telling you, hey, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. If you keep doing this, 
really bad things are going to happen. So please, you know, if you come to me right now, I'll forget everything. I'll forgive you and I'll forget everything. You'll wipe the slate clean. Multiple times this has happened. And so he's like, all right, you want to silence the people that I'm sending to to tell my message. You don't want to hear. You don't want to change your ways. You want to continue defiling the temple and sinning against me. Okay, well, now there's no way out of it. You're getting destroyed. And now that they're getting destroyed, they're crying out and saying, the Lord has forsaken the land the Lord does not see. No, you forsook the land that God gave you and you didn't see God. That line there, that must have annoyed God so much. That, that must have gotten him even more angry. Holy. And as for me also, my eye will neither spare nor will I have pity, but I will recompense their deeds on their own head. Just then, the man clothed with linen, who had the inkhorn at his side, reported back, I have done as you commanded me. Oof. Okay, what is the inkhorn for? I was thinking, I don't know, I immediately thought of like, hey, what if it's like a death note type of thing? Except instead of writing the name of the person in the note, the notebook is the one that has the power. It's the actual ink or the pen. So he is writing down judgments with that ink and destroying everything. I don't know. I'm just making up fantasy in my own head. But I'm just, what was the, what is the ink horn for? I don't know. Anyways. <laughs> and I looked. But I told you today is going to be interesting. Like, that was interesting. And there in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared something like a sapphire stone. That would be the throne, right? We talked about that before. Of the likeness of a throne. So this is the second time. So right now, we, were t we talked about that before, right? How Ezekiel, it was a vision. So... He might have seen these things literally in his vision, but that's not necessarily the case. It might not necessarily be that way in real life. Or did he see these things and that's actually what it was? Or is he being a bit colorful with his vocabulary? But now that he's talking about it a second time, and describing it the exact same way, I'm thinking this is what actually what he saw. So now it's down to the two. Is this what he saw in his vision? Most likely. Probably yes. And, but does it reflect reality? That's the question. Why, you know, if it was, if it didn't reflect, if it didn't reflect reality, you know, I'm thinking, okay, you, I mean, you know, if it didn't reflect reality and it was like a vision and, you know, it was just in his head and stuff, would it be persistent through multiple visions? I'm guessing, I'm, I'm thinking because it's persistent through multiple visions, we have two visions now where it's seeing very specifically the same thing, that this is what God intended for him to see. And if God intended for him to see it this way, it is most likely that in actuality. So the firmament, <clears throat> we talked about that, the way, the, way, the way they used to view the world before. And we talked about the sapphire stone, the throne sitting up top the firmament. And that's where God resides. So maybe that's crazy. If that's, that's, that's crazy. The appearance of the likeness of a throne. Then, he spoke to the man clothed with linen. Go in among the wheels under the cherub. Fill your hands with. Okay, see the the and he sp and he spoke to the man with the with the and with, and he spoke to the man clothed with linen, uh, and said, "Oh, and he." 
God did. Coals of fire from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. Go in among the wheels under the cherub. Fill your hands with coals of fire from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. Remember we talked about how the living creatures glowed, they pulsated like hot coals. And we talked about the wheels beside the cherubim or beside the living creatures. Some uh, artist depictions had th them like this, right? Within. It seemed like they were talking about that they were beside, though. Like we have some with them depicting them beside. Like that, you know? Um, but let's see. Go in among the wheels. Go in among the wheels. So the man would go in among the wheels under the cherubim. Fill your hands with coals of fire from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. So either the wheels were big enough for him to go inside of or he's talking about put your hands in and get the coals. Fill your hands with coals of fire and scatter them over the city. So there were coals of fire within the, in, the, uh, in the wheels. Or are we getting it from the cherubim? I'm, I'm, putting, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like overlapping living creatures and cherubim here. I'm sort of looking at them as synonyms right now. Maybe I shouldn't, but I'm going based off that description we got earlier too. I'm, I'm like, you know, um, are we getting the, the coals from among the cherubim? So we're getting it up from among the cherubim. Are we getting these coals like from in within the cherubim? What does that mean from among the cherubim? I'm getting the specifics here. So, uh, with words, and that's an issue with with reading translations. Um, ba -ba 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 -bum -ba -ba -bum. Let's see. Ten. Two. Coals of fire are sometimes related to the chastisement for cleansing, and other at times to judgment by fiery catastrophe. Let's see if another commentary is talking a bit more about the act the actions being done I doubt it this was the command directed to the man clothed with linen who was the one who marked the few faithful in Jerusalem God commanded his angel to take the burning coals and scatter them over the city previously we read Jer Jerusalem would be, be would be judged by siege, slaughter, famine, and disease. Now we learn that Jerusalem will also be burnt, and the fire comes from the throne and glory of God itself. The coals of fire come from among the cherubim. So are we taking it from within the cherubim's body because we knew they were glowing like coals? I don't know. I don't know. What do you guys think about that? And scatter them over the city. And he went in as I watched. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and paused over the threshold of the temple, and the mm. house was filled with the cloud. And the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard even Imagine in the outer this. court. Like the voice of Almighty God when he speaks. Then it happened when he commanded the man clothed in linen. Take fire from among the wheels, from among the cherubim. That he went in. So the wheels and are fiery. Stood beside the wheels, and the cherub stretched out his hand from among the cherubim to the fire that was among the cherubim, 
and took some of it and put it into the hands of the man clothed with linen who took it and went out. The cherubim appeared to have the form of a man's hand under their wings. And when I looked... Okay, so they didn't just have wings. They had, they had hands as well. There were four wheels by the cherubim. One wheel by one cherub. And another wheel Just like the living creatures. by each other cherub. The wheels appeared to have the color of a barrel stone. Barrel stone, right? We talked about that. We talked about that, right? Around this color. And I thought of this idea. What, like, uh, look at this. They're wheels of that color. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, top down. I'm just trying to figure out what this is. Just thinking out loud. Top down. How did I? Yeah. How? I spelled that completely wrong, right? But see what I mean? I don't know. It's the same color. They're they're wheels, I guess. I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out what it looked like. Shut up. The wheels appeared to have the color of a barrel stone. Just trying to figure out what he As saw. As for their appearance, all four looked alike. As it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went toward any of their four directions. They did not turn aside when they went, but followed in the direction the head was facing. They did not turn aside when they... But that's, as for their appearance, all four looked alike, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. So that's where they get this... Where is it? This idea with the wheel within a wheel. And they turned in all four directions. ...in the direction the head was facing. They did not turn aside... When they went, and we touched on that before, also, right? They were, they were creatures of purpose. They didn't deviate like us, right? Sometimes we fall into temptation and we veer off into different directions, but they walked forward and they didn't deviate. So they were creatures of strong will. Aside, when they went. And their whole body, with their back, their hands, their wings, and the wheels that the four had, were full of eyes. All that is crazy. We were talking about the living creatures. They didn't mention eyes. They mentioned eyes on the wheels, not on the body. Maybe that was just left out, but... That is crazy. Imagine, see, imagine seeing stuff like this. Like, when you think of an angel, do you think of this? This is literally, this is like some, when I look at this, I really think, okay, this is like some mythological beast or some fan-made creation in some fantasy. You know what I mean? That's what do you what do you guys make of this? Do you think he? I'm I'm sure he actually saw this. But does it exist beyond his vision? Outside of his dream. That is my question. Wheels that the four had were full of eyes all around. 
As for the wheels, they were called in my hearing, Wheel. Each one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face, the face of a man. The third... What's the face of a cherub? The face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. Okay, so that's different than the living creatures because the living creatures was the face of an ox, face of a man, lion, and eagle. Where's the face of a cherub? Let's see, 14, 10, 14. Ezekiel describes the wheels and then the cherubim. Um, see chapter 1 for, for details in this vision. But then again, we don't know if it's just talking about the same thing here. Only in 14 is something different from the description, whereas one of the four faces in chapter 1, verse 10, is an ox. Here it is a cherub. There are ancient sculptures with animal bodies and wings, but human faces, sometimes called cherubs. The difference of the faces between chapter 1, verse 10, and chapter 10, verse 14 should not be called an error. It is possible that the images that Ezekiel saw were changing from time to time. Oh. So, were the living creatures the cherubs? The third, the face of a lion, and the fourth, the face of an eagle. And the cherubim were lifted up. This was the living creature I saw by the river Kibar. Oh, right, there you go. So this is the same thing he saw. But why are we referring to them as cherubim now? And he's using the word cherubim as if he as if the cherub the word was known before, which it was. The cherubim were on the ark. But this is the first time we're getting a description of the cherubim like this. So Could cherubim, is cherubim synonymous with just a generic angel as well? Let me look up a commentary. The cherubim were standing on the street. Where's the description part? Ezekiel 1, 18 described eyes in connection to, with the wheels. Here we learn that the cherubim themselves were full of eyes all around. This matches the later description of cherubim found in Revelation 4, 6. Interesting. The image seems bizarre to the modern reader, but one must remember that this is a visionary experience and surrealistic features may overwhelm realism. Adam Clark spoke for many who are, who are mystified at the nature and complexity of these descriptions. And perhaps from the whole of this vision and its difficulties, we, he will see the pro, pro, uh, pro, propriety of the council of rabbis ordering Rabbi Ananias 300 barrels of oil to light his lamp during the time it would be necessary for him to employ in explaining this one vision. Holy. I don't know. It sort of sounds like a hallucination. That's why I'm sort of like... Does this exist in real life? Or is it just in his vision? Do you guys think he was actually seeing that? I mean, I'm sure he actually saw it, but do you think it was a result of a, of a hallucination? Or this is what God wanted him to see? Each one had four faces. This is almost the same description of the cherubim found in Ezekiel chapter 1. Here Ezekiel didn't describe four faces on each cherub. Just one face Turned around, turned toward him. Another difference lies in that in the previous passage, the faces were listed as man, a lion, and a fox, and an eagle. Here, they are listed as cherub, a man, a lion, and an eagle. For some reason, Ezekiel chose to use the word cherub to describe the face associated with the ox. Not necessarily. See the commentary in my Bible saying that the faces could have been changing. And what is the face of a cherub? 
Some explain this by saying that since these beings are cherubim and each face is actually the faces of a cherub, there was simply some unknown reason why the substitute word was used. So what is the face of a cherub? If a cherub has multiple faces, what is the face of a cherub? And <clears throat> why are all the depictions of the Ark of the Covenant, don't? why don't they have the cherubim depicted like we see in Ezekiel? Which is why I'm asking the question, Is can cherubim be used as an all-encompassing word for angel? Some explain this by saying that the face of a cherub is something like the face of an ox. Some, ex But if a cherub has multiple faces, that means a cherub's face is not one particular thing. Some explain this by the error of a scribe who copied the text. So we have no clue, looks like. This was, a, this was the living creature I saw by the river Kibar. This is a direct reference to the vision of Ezekiel 1. Okay. What do you guys make of this? This is very, very, very interesting. We're lifted up. This was the living creature I saw by the river Kibar. When the cherubim went, the wheels went beside them. Just like the living creatures. And when the cherubim lifted their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also did not turn from beside them. When the cherubim stood still, the wheels stood still. And when one was lifted up, the other lifted itself up. Mm. For the spirit of the living creature was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple. And was lift the spirit of the living creature was in them? We talked about the spirit being within them in Ezekiel 1, but the spirit of the living creature, what is that? The wheels also did not turn. This is the same description of the wheels and of their association with the cherubim as described in Ezekiel chapter 1. The idea is that the cherubim and the wheels are perfectly coordinated in their motions together. They were also, they were so closely connected that Ezekiel could write, the spirit of the living creature was in them. Oh, okay, so the spirit of the living creature, the cherubim, was in the wheel, is which is why they moved in unison. What do you think the wheels are? I don't know. I have no clue. Still, the wheels stood still. And when one was lifted up, the other lifted itself up. For the spirit of the living creature was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels were beside them, and they stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. Can hallucinations be consistent? I don't know. Because this is not that's what I'm saying. This is not the first time he see he saw this and he's seeing the same exact thing. He's being he's consistent with what he's seeing. So is it real? I, this is crazy. This is the living creature I saw under the God of Israel by the river Kibar. And I knew they were cherubim. Each one had four faces and each one four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings, and the likeness of their faces was the same as the faces which I had seen by the river Kibar, their Look, appearance the and their persons. They each went straight forward. So same thing he saw. 
even though he said ox and th the cherub in this one. How would you guys explain this? I mean, maybe he doesn't need an explanation. Maybe that's what he saw, and that's what it. That's what. That's how they look like. But then again, I brought up that question in Ezekiel one, right? God doesn't like the mixing of diff multiple kinds, right? And in the Noah's Ark, that was the whole thing, right? Each two of each kind, because he doesn't like the mixing. He doesn't even like the the grafting of different uh, species of plants and stuff, right? Each one must be according to its own kind. God doesn't like mixing, right? There were even laws where they were they shouldn't have mixed fabric of two kinds. Um, and here we have a godly, heavenly, unearthly creature that has the face of a ox, a man a lion and an eagle that reminds me more <clears throat> of creatures like the sphinx or like all these a lot of these pagan um pagan uh ideologies and whatnot have these type of things with uh half human half animal right that's why that's why um i think that's why sodom and gomorrah were destroyed right they're, they're they're mixing with animals. Because God, like the bloodline needs to be pure. The genealogy needs to be pure. That's why uh, that was pointed out with uh, Noah again. I don't know. It's interesting. A lot of questions around this. So... Any of you, any insight from you guys? Any thoughts, theories, hypotheses, anything? <laughs> Let me know down in the comment section. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's house, which faces eastward. And there at the door of the gate, were 25 men, among whom I saw Jeazaniah, the son of Azar, and Pelatiah, the son of Beniah, princes of the people. So he's seeing specifically the layout of the city. He's seeing people that were real. Nothing is unrealistic here. So maybe what he saw with the cherubs weren't unreal, the cherubim weren't unrealistic there as well. And he said to me, Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and give wicked counsel in this city, who say, The time is not near to build houses. This city is the cauldron, and we are the meat. Therefore, prophesy against them. Holy. Prophesy, O son of man. Then the Spirit of the Lord yeah, why are you settling down and building speak. houses? You ought to be Thus cooked. says the Lord. Thus you have said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. You have multiplied your slain in this city, and you have filled its streets with the slain. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Your slain, whom you have laid in its midst, they are the meat, and this city is the cauldron. Mm. But I shall bring you out of the midst of it. You have feared the sword, and I will bring a sword upon you, says the Lord God. And I will bring you out of its midst, and deliver you into the hands of strangers, and execute judgments on you. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you at the border of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. This city shall not be your cauldron, nor shall you be the meat in its midst. I will judge you at the border of Israel. 
and you shall know that I am the Lord. For you have not walked in my statutes, nor executed my judgments, but have done according to the customs of the Gentiles, which are all around you. Now it happened, while I was prophesying, that Pelatiah, the son of Beniah, died. Then I fell on my face, and cried with a loud voice, and said, Oh, Lord God, will you make a complete end of the remnant of Israel? Again, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, your brethren, your relatives, your countrymen, and all the house of Israel in its entirety are those about whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get far away from the Lord. This land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, Although I have cast them far off among the Gentiles, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I shall be a little sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Mm. Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples, assemble you from the well, countries not where lost. you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. God's going to cultivate his and people they before will go in there. the lands. And they will take away Bring them back all to its the promised detestable land and rebuild things, Jerusalem. And all its abominations from there. Then I will give them one heart. And I will put a new spirit within them. And take the stony heart out of their flesh. Mm. And give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts follow the desire for their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads. Says the Lord God. So... You're not going to be punished for a sin that you didn't commit. You can come to God. God will be there for you. But if you don't, yeah. So the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was high above them. Yeah, I don't think the we I don't think they were the within the wheels. The, Lord I think the wheels were beside went up them. From the midst of the city, and stood on the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Then the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to those in captivity. And the vision that I had seen went up from me. So I spoke to those in captivity of all the things the Lord had shown me. They must have thought he was crazy. Or they believed him and were very scared. Now the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house which has eyes to see but does not see, and ears to hear but does not hear, for they are a rebellious house. Therefore, son of man, prepare your belongings for captivity, and go into captivity by day in their sight. You shall go from your place into captivity to another place in mm. their sight. It may be that they will consider, though they are a rebellious house. By day you shall bring out your belongings in their sight, as though going into captivity. And at evening you shall go in their sight like those who go into captivity. Dig through the wall in their sight and carry your belongings out through it. In their sight you shall bear them on your shoulders and carry them out at twilight. 
You shall cover your face so that you cannot see the ground. For I have made you a sign to the house of Israel. So I did as I was commanded. I brought out my belongings by day, as though going into captivity. And at evening I dug through the wall with my hand. I brought them out at twilight, and I bore them on my shoulder in their sight. And in the morning, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said to you, what are you doing? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, this burden concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel who are among them. Say, I am a sign to you. As I have done, so shall it be done to them. They shall be carried away into captivity. And the prince who is among them shall bear his belongings on his shoulder at twilight and go out. They shall dig through the wall to carry them out through it. He shall cover his face so that he cannot see the ground with his eyes. I will also spread my net over him, and he shall be caught in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans, yet he shall not see it, though he shall die there. Mm -hmm. I will scatter to every wind all who are around him to help him, and all his troops, and I will draw out the sword after them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord, when I scatter them among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. But I will spare a few of their men from the sword, yep. from famine, and from pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the Gentiles wherever they go. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, eat your bread with quaking and drink your water with trembling and anxiety and say to the people of the land, thus says the Lord God to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the land of Israel, they shall eat their bread with anxiety and drink their water with dread so that her Imagine land may like be that. emptied of all who are in it because of the violence of all those who dwell in it. Then the cities that are inhabited shall be laid waste, and the land shall become desolate, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, what is this proverb that you people have about the land of Israel? which says, the days are prolonged and every vision fails. Tell them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will lay this proverb to rest, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say to them, the days are at hand and the fulfillment of every vision. For no more shall there be any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord, I speak, and the word which I speak will come to pass. It will no Not more like be Not like any of the other gods. For in your days, false prophets, o or rebellious priests. house, I will say the word and perform it. Again. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, look, the house of Israel is saying, the vision that he sees is for many days from now, and he prophesies of times far off. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord God, none of my words will be postponed anymore, but the word... Right, because they heard it from Isaiah, they heard it from Jeremiah. Well, it happened during Jeremiah, but they heard it from Isaiah, and they were like, okay, nothing happened. You died, and we're still fine living the way we are. So they got a little bit complacent, it looks like. And they didn't want to change their ways regardless. Which I speak, 
will be done. Man. Whew. A lot in today's reading. With the cherubim to this, talking about the judgment. And tomorrow we're jump, jumping into foolish prophets. So it looks like we're expanding on topics we sort of touched before. The 14, idolatry will be punished. We're seeing that it's being punished, but um, with Ezekiel, that's another thing I'm noticing. We're, get, we're getting a lot of things fleshed out. We're delving deeper, more specifics, more detailed information. Um, and that's just the nature of, of rep repetition, right? We're going, we went over it in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. So we're getting multiple perspectives of the same thing. So we're obviously going to be getting more, learning newer things um, each time we, we read. So um, we're going to jump into 13 tomorrow. Hope you guys enjoyed today's reading. And like I said, if you guys have any insight on what we read today, especially regarding <laughs> the, the vision that Ezekiel had with the cherubim, and and all that let me know down in the comment section please <laughs> and uh yeah so hope you guys have a great rest of your day and i'll see you tomorrow take care bye-bye